Now it is time to take longer strides. Time for a great new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. The countdown to the moon had begun. This is Colonel John Shorty Powers. Using President Kennedy's commitment as a springboard, America set out on the most ambitious undertaking in the history of mankind. Sending men to the moon required development of the world's most powerful rocket, a Saturn V, with seven and a half million pounds of thrust, and the fantastically complex Apollo spacecraft. And all this in record time. The Apollo-Saturn V combination, 364 feet tall, is assembled vertically on its own mobile launcher inside the vehicle assembly building. The Apollo spacecraft begins its journey to the moon at the incredibly slow speed of one mile per hour as it travels three and a half miles out to the launch pad. The measured cadence of the countdown continues as the rocket and its precious payload undergoes a meticulous checkout under the watchful eyes of the crew at launch control. The first Apollo Saturn V rocket lifted off from the Kennedy Space Center on November 9, 1967. Although it carried a dummy Apollo payload with no man aboard, its flawless flight profile generated renewed enthusiasm on the part of American spacemen. A second unmanned Apollo Saturn V was successfully launched on April 5, 1968. And then on December 21, 1968, Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders embarked on a pioneering journey around the moon and back to Earth. Borman, Lovell, and Anders rode the transfer van from their crew quarters to the launch pad with full awareness that other Americans would tread in their footsteps destined for a moon landing, a moon landing that they would not make. But they were also aware that if their mission was fulfilled, they would blaze a trail in history that would not be duplicated by any human. As launch time for this historic mission approached, we hear first the voice of Apollo Launch Control, Mr. Jack King, counting off the final seconds. Ten, nine, we have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. Four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit. We lift have, off. The clock we have is lift running. Off. Lift off at 7.51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We have cleared the Launch tower. Roger. Roger. How do you hear, Houston? Right clear. Launch for one Bravo, Apollo 8. The pathway to the moon was paved by the flights of Mercury and Gemini. Now, the plume of the rocket engine of the mighty Saturn V alters its form and shape as it hurtles through and out of the Earth's atmosphere. These pictures were taken from an Air Force jet flying some eight miles above the Earth. At an altitude of some 17 miles, the long, narrow plume of liftoff has broadened and trails more than a thousand feet behind. About 400 feet behind the rocket engines, the shock wave created by the supersonic flow of hot exhaust gases shows plainly as a bright V. In spite of a speed of about 2,200 miles an hour, the exhaust plume has started to swirl up the side of the first stage of the Saturn V. At an altitude of a 160,000 feet, approximately 31 miles, and moving now at a speed of about 4,000 miles an hour, the reverse plume extends the entire length of the first stage. Apollo 8, Houston, you are go for staging, over. When staging occurs, 
the first stage falls away under the blast of the rocket engine of the second stage. S2 has ignited, we can confirm. And the thrust looks good. All engines, all sources show the second stage is burning perfectly. Two minutes, 51 seconds into the mission. The five J2 engines of the second stage flame to life with a million pounds of thrust, and they boost altitude to 114 miles and a speed 15,000 miles an hour. Later, the second stage will also drop off, and the single J2 third stage engine will place that stage and its spacecraft in a parking orbit around the Earth at a speed of 17,400 miles an hour. All systems are checked in Earth orbit. If all systems are go, a five-minute engine burn boosts the speed of the vehicle to 24,000 miles per hour, leaving Earth orbit to start on that long, arcing lunar trajectory. Just after breaking Earth orbit, the Apollo 8 crew took this picture of clouds blanketing the Atlantic Ocean and West Africa. From the void of space, command pilot Frank Borman described the scene. Sure is the Earth. It's a beautiful, beautiful view with a predominantly blue background and uh, just huge covers of uh, white clouds. As the Apollo 8 crew went into orbit around the moon, they took pictures of the never-before-seen backside of the moon. It was Christmas Eve on Earth. Astronaut Jim Lovell put the telephoto lens on his camera to shoot this picture of the crater Langrenus from an altitude of 100 miles above the moon's surface. The small circular crater nearby is known as Langrenus C. As the Apollo 8 crew rounded the moon on their first lunar orbit, they marveled at the beautiful sight, a new sight for man, an earth rise. Jim Lovell reported his impressions of the earth coming into view from the backside of the moon, and the Houston controller remarked, a beautiful moon out tonight. Frank Borman replied, I was just thinking, what a beautiful earth out tonight. Frank Borman and his crew were 250,000 miles from Earth. But they had not forgotten the time and the significance of the time to Earth man. It's now approaching uh, lunar sunrise. And uh, for all the people back on Earth, the crew of Apollo 8 has a message that we would like to send to you. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the Earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament. And divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. God saw that it was good. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. Nearing Earth, Gravity acts on the spacecraft and boosts its speed to the same 24,000 miles an hour achieved in its departure from Earth. Shortly before reaching the atmosphere, the crew separates the command module from the service module, and the service module hurtles into the atmosphere in a spectacular display, much like a so-called shooting star. The command module, with its precious human crew, must enter the atmosphere at a precise angle of between five and seven and a half degrees from horizontal. If the angle is too steep, the spaceship will burn up. If the angle is too shallow, the spaceship will skip out into a new orbit, 
probably out around the moon again. And that trip takes at least two and a half days one way. There is not enough life-sustaining oxygen for that added trip. After an enthusiastic reception, Frank Borman spoke for Bill Anders and Jim Lovell and thanked members of the USS Guadalcanal for their contribution to the success of the Apollo 8 mission. Apollo 8's dramatically successful journey to the moon was followed by Apollo 9, launched on March 3, 1969. Astronauts McDivitt, Scott, and Schweikert were launched into Earth orbit to perform a complete dress rehearsal of the moon landing, but were limited to Earth orbit. The Apollo 9 crew turned the command module around and had this interesting view of the lunar module still encased on top of the upper stage of the Saturn V.